Vidhai Surya Sneha Satish Jayant Garima. A lot of repeat attendees. Astha. Hi, Astha. Hi, Adarsh. Thank you guys for joining in. We will begin in a bit, just waiting for some more people to join us. Then we'll start. Vivek, Radha. Hi, guys. Good evening. Hope you guys are joining either from work or from somewhere. But I'm so glad you guys are joining for today's session because it's going to be great. Abhinav, hi. Super, super. Pranav, we have more attendees coming in, right? Yes. It could be right now. Okay. Yeah. We will wait for five minutes and then start, yeah. okay? Quite happy with the attendee count. Thank you guys for joining in. Vishakha, Vivek, Shweta. Hi guys, good evening. Nilesh, Niharika, thank you for joining in. Hey Rohit. Hi, Shweta. Good evening. All right. Superb. Thank you so much, uh, everyone, for joining in. Uh, we are back with another session of Wellness Wednesday. And uh, it's an absolute pleasure, uh, you know, to start the month of December uh, with, with, with such a great topic. And, uh, you know, this month is definitely something that all of us are looking forward to in terms of, uh, you know, a lot of things, because again, it's the festive month and, you know, all of us are saving, spending, doing whatnot, planning trips, going out. And uh, I think uh, with this whole festive rejuvenation period, it's so important for all of us to, you know, sort of manage our finances, manage our well-being and manage everything well, because I think that's what is going to steadfast you for a better tomorrow or a better year, I would say. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. Today's session is going to be really special because it's in partnership with investment. investment and uh, we are really looking forward to this session on financial well-being with Sandeep Rao, uh, who is the head of uh, research uh, at investment. and. Uh, we're going to learn about personal finance. We're going to understand how to earn, save, grow, and protect your money. Uh, when I say protect your money, I think it's so important for all of us to understand what exactly is the process behind securing your funds and actually you know, putting them in the right space so that tomorrow you reap the benefits of the wealth that you're creating. Right. So it's, it's going to be an amazing session. There's a lot that we're going to learn. And for people who are actually uh, looking forward to some kind of stock market investing tips, I would really suggest you to guys uh, go and follow investment because uh, these people are going to definitely be uh, your go-to, you know, sort of research platform to understand how do you manage your wealth in the right way. And uh, Sandeep here is an amazing person. I think we've sort of interacted with him earlier uh, on a lot of other platforms and a lot of other uh, events where we've kind of, you know, learned so much from him when it comes to his uh, experience and how he has his whole look towards wealth and how to manage wealth, right? So I think it's going to be a great session. Uh, let me all quickly introduce you to uh, Sandeep. Uh, Sandeep uh, has 20 plus years of experience in understanding and interpreting uh, the behavior of financial markets. His experience in quantitative trading strategies, investments, data science, and content analysis has really helped him focus and achieve various feats in the financial domain. And today he's here, uh, you know, to sort of help us understand how systematic investment works uh, and 
he really believes in a qualitative way of living and a quantitative way of living which is why his entire discourse today uh, with you guys for an entire hour is going to be about his passion for finance his passion for numbers and how exactly has he transformed his life uh, you know over this time and how exactly can you implement these strategies in a very simple way in your life right so that's about sandeep and a very quick or a quirky fact about sandeep is that he's either thinking about finance or teaching someone about it because he's he's always included himself in this kind of an activity all the time so you can either find him talking about finance somewhere or he's teaching someone what finance is and uh, tomorrow it could be you uh, joining another session with sandeep probably or you could be reaching out to him over linkedin talking to him about finance asking your dads to go and talk about finance with him right so no gender bar no age bar sandeep is a very cool guy and i am totally excited in joining this session today because it's going to be super great and i am personally very bored of numbers i don't like finance to uh, to be like very clear and honest but this session is going to be fun because i know uh, from where sandeep comes and how he is has how he has been you know sort of spreading this knowledge for a long time now uh, which sort of brings me to the point that you know this this session is so great and is going to be great so please hang on and please stay till the end and we're going to have a lot of quick questions that we'll follow towards the end of the session and we'll again have the 15 minute q and a that we usually have during all the sessions towards the end so please stay with us and enjoy the session over to you sandeep thank you thank you abhishek um, you know for that lovely intro so without much ado uh a, a quick uh, uh, background in terms of uh, you know where i come from and uh, you know what i do so at investment i lead um, you know research about different models a bit of content related work and so on but prior to that um, you know i've largely been in three areas technology uh, you know understanding human psychology uh, behavior and investing so these are kind of the three areas which i uh, spend time on and uh, my bias as uh, abhishek said has largely been about using science using data to make our uh, you know be it financial well being or any other aspect of life better and uh, hopefully you would see that through the session where uh, most of what we share what i share would be you know from the lens of science and from the lens of data so uh, let's jump in okay and uh, so uh, so today we're going to focus on you know what we would call the four pillars of financial wellbeing so these are like the four things which we need to sort out before we do anything else in our financial life especially and uh, they are everything it's like a continuum okay so you uh, you need to uh, just one second yeah so so we if you if you look at our own careers you know we start off somewhere around our 20s and we get into our first jobs and that's where we start earning and uh, maybe we earn well or we may not earn well especially if we are at the beginning of our careers we have a lot of things to spend on uh, an iphone to buy i'm sure and uh, that leaves us with and, and a lot of credit card bills to pay and that that leaves us with nothing much to say but as we kind of you know grow further in our careers uh, things get better for most of us and we get to save more we we become more smarter and uh, we earn more and uh, that that leaves us with a fair bit of surplus and then comes you know growing that money that you say we want that money to work for us uh, because we work our you know full times we 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 try to save but then money also should work by itself and that's what the growing and the investing bit is and over a period of time uh, you have a whole lot of savings with you uh, which has grown considerably and you get to a point where you tell yourself this i don't want to lose the money that i made how do i protect that so so we're going to talk about each of these aspects and how they kind of fit into our own individual lives at any point of time if you have any questions you know uh, jot them down and i would be happy to answer them uh, towards the end of the session okay so um, so with that we move we'll will uh, you know get into the most interesting part of the session which is earning um i'm not going to talk about how to get a you know a salary hike 
but it's something more important than that probably. Okay, so um, one second. Just trying to see why the slide is not moving. Mm. Uh, try clicking the arrow buttons on the keyboard. Yeah, yeah, I did that, but it's... Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, now it's working. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, all right. So we start with, uh, as I said, earning, okay? Now, if you look at, uh, you know, as I was telling you, uh, I'll just minimize this. Okay, so I was telling you, if you, if you look at earning, okay, we go through this cycle, uh, and this is what data tells us, and it's largely applicable for most of us who, who work in a kind of a corporate kind of a setup, and this is what it applies. So when we are kind of young, um, that's a phase where we are uh, typically unsure about what we want to do. And it's also a, a particular aspect of youth where uh, we want to explore because we, we may study something, then we may explore a different kind of a job. We may not like it. You may start with sales. You may say, no, I don't want to do sales. I'd want to do something in technology, things like that. So, so that exploration typically goes on for five to six years, seven years sometimes, and so on. And that's why this early part of you know, our careers are uh, what, is, what, is, what we would call as the exploratory phase. And because there's so many shifts which are happening in this phase, the earning potential is not something which would on an average go high here because you're exploring. So you, you join one company, you don't like the job, you move on to another one, maybe, may not be, you may not get a hike and you don't care about that either so long as the work that you're doing is great and so on. But then once you go through that phase for, let's say, six or seven years, there's more clarity which comes in. So you figure out that yeah, this is what I want to do. These are the kind of things that you want to do. Some of you may get a postgraduate degree. You know, all that happens typically uh, five or six years into your work. And uh, the golden phase of your career or anyone's career on an average is around those 20 years between 30s and 50s. Okay. Now, if you see uh, the potential takes a massive, uh, you know, uh, 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 shift between 30 and 40. And that happens because this is where the best of your abilities and the best of the opportunities come together. And uh, this is what you would want to exploit in terms of your career. Uh, make sure that you figure it out till 30s and you're exploiting all that you figured out between your 30s and 40s. And 40 to 50 is more kind of uh, going deeper. And 50 to 60 is you kind of ease out. You, you kind of uh, start looking forward. You know, uh, you've been there, done that. Sometimes there are people who would want to make another career shift post 50s. And all of these aspects, you know, affect earning. So in terms of earning, on an average, if you look at the data, this is what it tells us that um, most people who've done uh, reasonably well would have done well or would um, you know and that would happen between the ages of uh, 30 and 50. And moving to uh, what kind of factors affect earnings? So the primarily four things which come into being. Okay. I'm not suggesting that you should find work uh, or a career that pays more. That's not the idea here. But what I'm trying to say over here through uh, through these points is what are the factors which affect it? Okay. So one is obviously education and skills. So the kind of education that you have, the skills that you have, that has a very important factor. And the market value for a specific skill set. So there's only so much value that a particular uh, you know, role that you are playing can generate. So if um, the market value of a, um, you know, a, uh, you know, a software uh, engineer is X, that that typically would be in a range of whatever you know x maybe 10 to 20 percent 30 percent here and there but it remains in that range likewise it could be a doctor you could be a dentist you, you could be working in an oil rig doesn't matter but each um, role or each career has got a specific market value there would be a minor deviation to it but that's pretty much what it is but what makes a much larger impact uh, and this is what you know uh, data tells us is the individual ability and adaptability. So you could be a doctor, but how did you adapt to the requirements in the market? How did you change yourself to what others want? And that has a major bearing on your uh, potential to earn. 
and also uh, external economic factors, which which obviously has an impact in terms of you know if the larger economy is doing well, you would do well. Um, you would be able to kind of ride that tide, like it happens in any other space. So so these are kind of the factors which you know you may want to think about when it comes to earning. Okay, and um, as I said, there's only so much that um, you know we can do. But being adaptable, being um, you know, uh, developing the right kind of skill set—that's something which is well within our control, and um, there's no two ways about that one. So with that, uh, you know, once you earn, as I said, your ability to save over time increases. And um, if you think about an earning, there are you know, you earn let's say hundred, and uh, when you are young for the compensation that you get, for the salaries that you get, around 70 to 80% of it may go into sustenance. Now, sustenance means, you know, paying your bills, all the minimum things, your travel costs, everything, you know, you're left with very little to save. And that's what happens for a good decade where you are uh, marginally above sustenance levels or very close to sustenance levels. And that's what this graph tells us over here that there's nothing much for you to save and that's that's there and then as you go forward you would have you know your compensation increases but you can only eat so much you can only travel so much the the additional costs of your sustenance don't go as much don't go up as much as your average compensation goes up so um, it's also possible that at this phase you may uh, get married you could be a part of a dual income family. And that again adds, actually reduces your sustenance cost because they're like two people, uh, you know, uh, living together and earning together. So that reduces your sustenance cost and increases your ability to save. And that's, um, that's possible. And that's what adds to the overall, uh, you know, increasing saving potential and the same curve, which I uh, shared with you. So, so in terms of saving, this is, uh, this is how the general graph would look like, uh, so long as we're aware about it. But the questions are, uh, you know, there are a lot of questions which you try to answer in terms of saving. This is how it pans out, but at an individual level, how does it affect each one of us? And that's what we are going to look at. So the biggest thing, so let's say if you are under 30 right now, which I'm sure a lot of you are, uh, maybe you can save 10 to 20 percent of your salary should you or should you not save how much should you save okay so those are the questions which kind of would usually bother us uh, if you speak with your parents i'm sure they may sometimes tell you that you know what i was saving so much when i was your age you you don't seem to be doing that you're spending way more uh, some of you may be spending much more than what you're earning and you know adding to your credit card uh, um, debt as well that's also there so each one of us would have a different kind of a saving profile. But what does uh, science tell us? What does behavioral science tell us about saving? Now, if you look at it, uh, if you are under 30, and uh, if, you are, if your income is very close to your sustenance levels, whatever you try to save is, uh, is going to be minimal because you don't have much to save. Now, Science tells us, if you look at it, that it actually doesn't matter whether you save or don't save when the quantum of saving itself is small, okay? So it's not gonna affect you. But uh, what does help is if you get into a habit of saving early, it's a habit which gets into, you know, forms. So that becomes, that's something which is useful. But in terms of financially, does it really make an impact whether you save early or not? The answer is actually mixed. It does not really make a huge difference because uh, if you're going to save very little, even if you compound it, it's not going to add much in, in the long run. But what's definitely important is saving uh, while you're in your mid-career phase, which means uh, post-30s when you start earning substantially, uh, that's the point where you got to get serious about saving. And because the quantum of saving now is more, and uh, the effect that it would have in terms of long-term effects that it would have, compounding effects that it would have, would be much more. And uh, so that's what becomes key. But then, yeah, so, but the other thing which people say is if you don't save when you're young, um, 
all of a sudden developing that habit of saving when you're in your 30s is not easy. So, so that's where I would leave you um, as far as the habit of saving versus um, the science of saving is concerned. So you may want to think about it. If you think, you know, you will develop that habit when once you are in your 30s and you take it from there, good for you. Okay. And um, so, so that's, that's, that's where the science is on that. And this is more interesting bit there. Okay. It's not so linear. So, so when it comes to even your early 30s, uh, late 20s, there is this concept of uh, diminishing utility of experience. What that means is, um, just try to imagine this. Uh, I'm sure some of you would want to, uh, you know, uh, buy a buy a bike and go all the way to let's say Spiti Valley to experience what it is. You know, uh, uh, riding all the way there. Some of you may want to experience something else. Maybe, uh, you know, each one of us has got something or else travel. You name it. So we all, uh, you know, each one of us has got something that we aspire to do. Now, um, so I just took an example. Um, let's say biking or bungee jumping at 27 versus 57. Which one would would you think would give you greater joy? Now, so this is where behavioral economic comes in. Uh, economics comes in, and it tells us that it's also important to follow what is known as the regret minimization framework, where Yes, uh, if you go bungee jumping or biking today, that would affect your saving. But at the same time, this particular experience is something which can be enjoyed only today. And if you let go of this phase in your life, you may not be able to kind of enjoy it tomorrow. So while saving is important, it's also uh, important to think about uh, you know, things which you would not want to regret in future. So, so don't oversave. That's another extreme where some people go. So they save to the to an extent that they regret it in their futures. That hey, you know what? I think I should have done that when I was young. So that's another aspect which uh, it's not easy. There are no easy straight answers, but uh, it's important to make sure that uh, we don't regret uh, saving way too much as well. So that's uh, that's in terms of uh, you know the behavior and the science uh, behind saving. And when we talk about saving, there's, there's another aspect which comes in. Um, and this comes in typically uh, post, uh, you know, around 30s or mid 30s, where you have a decent amount of, uh, you know, uh, savings and you could actually, this is the time where um, the banks and the relationship managers of various banks start calling you uh, you know, to give you loans, all sorts of loans. It could be to buy a car or buy a house or any sort of a loan. So, so debt typically comes into our lives at this time, okay, where, um, you know, the market economics or the banks and uh, all of them would push you to take some sort of a loan. And uh, so what's the take uh, on taking these loans uh, is something that we would spend time on. Okay, so first thing is, uh, I'll start bottom up. Uh, credit card debt is absolutely bad. Okay, so at any point in time in life, you know, avoid uh, credit card that's not a debt worth taking. So that's one. Uh, taking a loan for small purchases, it could be even, you know, including, let's say, things like cars or a two wheeler is fine because you're going to experience that asset, even though it's a depreciating asset, you're still experiencing it. It enhances your quality of life and all of that. So that is that is very much a part of it. At the same time, one of the largest, uh, you know, uh, in terms of size mortgages, which people take is a, a house usually. So typically 30s to mid 30s is when, you know, these days uh, when the affordability is relatively higher, uh, people think about, taking a loan to buy a house. Now, if you, if you look at the data about buying houses, uh, it's typically against taking a large, uh, you know, allocating a large part of your savings and servicing a loan, which, uh, you know, which you get stuck to. So, so behaviorally, there are a lot of issues when it comes to taking a large uh, home loan. One is you get stuck to it because you know you have to kind of repay that EMI every month. Uh, if you 
don't have a secure job, then it becomes difficult. You know, all those issues are there. Plus, more importantly, you don't get to diversify because a large part of your saving goes into one asset class, which is real estate. Okay, and you don't you're left with very little to kind of put in equities or any other debt or any other asset class. So all your money essentially goes into that one house, which would ten or fifteen years later be yours, but till the time you're paying. That EMI, that house is still not technically yours. So, so it, uh, so from that perspective, it's something that you would get stuck to. It reduces your risk-taking ability as well. So, not something which is recommended. Even in terms of appreciation, uh, real estate may not be the best asset class uh, where things, um, you know, where it could appreciate because um, real estate follows what is known as um, the second-order effects in the economy. So what that means is if the economy is doing well, the first thing that would happen is the stock markets would do well. Okay. And then, you know, that money would start showing in real estate markets and so on. So in terms of the order, if you are invested in the stock markets and the economy is doing well, your stocks are going to do well ahead of, ahead of real estate. So, so a lot of reasons, both uh, from an economic standpoint, um, you know, and from a career standpoint, why uh, renting is a far better option than, um, you know, buying. And uh, there would be very, very few instances where economically speaking, uh, renting, um, sorry, uh, buying would be better. Okay. So that's very, but in India currently, it's always, you know, renting, which economically makes sense. Um, you know, it's far cheaper to rent the same house than to buy it. All, all of those things. So that's one. But there's one aspect where there could be people who are very bad at saving. So, you know, they just spend their money. So for folks like that, real estate is better than nothing because it kind of forces you to put some money aside. Uh, but is that the best approach? No. It's like, if nothing, you, you can't do anything anyways, so might as well buy a house. That's fine. But other than that, you know, there's, there's nothing else that kind of goes, supports the idea of taking on a huge loan to buy a house early in your career. Uh, not something which, uh, you know, uh, which we would recommend. So that's one. Okay. So, uh, so that's about saving. So we spoke about uh, earnings. We spoke about saving. We spoke about taking on debt. So with that, uh, you know, we move to growing our money okay and which is what is investing okay so as our savings increase um, we have a surplus and now the choice is to invest that money somewhere so that it grows now but what exactly investing what does it mean so the text definition of investing is buying into an asset which increases in value doesn't matter what you buy a land and with an intention that the value of that land increases Fine, that's investing. You buy gold with an intention that you put some money in gold and the value of that would increase, that's investing. Likewise for um, you know, capital markets, doesn't matter. It could be an investment in something uh, you know, um, like an FD. That's also an investment because at the end of the day, value of that money increases. But the question which um, you would want to ask is how much should it really increase in value for it to make sense, okay? For example, you may want to put your money in FD and on an average, it would give you, let's say, 4 or 5% returns versus, let's say, you put your money in uh, equity markets where on an average, it may give you double that, maybe 8 or 9%. Okay, which one makes sense? Uh, so should you put all your money in an FD or should you put all your money in, uh, you know, a bunch of mutual funds or stocks? What is better? And to answer that question, what is better? we would have to look at a few uh, concepts which would help us you know, understand the whole space better. So one of the first things that we would want to look at is the idea of inflation, which means on an average, our cost of living starts um, you know, increasing, which means if um, you know, uh, a kg of rice would cost 100 bucks today, it's going to cost you 120 bucks tomorrow and uh, 130 bucks tomorrow while the amount of food that you eat is largely going to be the same uh, over 20, 30 years, but the cost of that food is going to increase and that's going to affect you 
and it's not just going to affect you but it would affect all other services that you buy because if you hire people they also are going to pay more for that food so they will charge a greater salary so in essence inflation has a multiplier effect on all sorts of costs that we have in our life okay so it's going to eat into our savings likewise the rent that you pay is going to increase by 5 or 6% on an average every year everything becomes expensive over a period of time and that's what causes that is a science by itself we are not getting into it but it does okay so things are not going to get cheaper as we go into future very few things will get cheaper but you know 95% of things are going to get expensive as we move into future and that's what is inflation so that's one now um, let's go back to this okay so let's say you put your money um, you have uh, 100 you put that 100 into a bank and the bank gives you uh, 3% returns or 5% returns and inflation also happens to be 5% on an average in a given year would you have made any money the answer to that question is no the even though the money which you had in your bank became 105 but the value of 100 also in you know reduces so that is why it's all the same now okay so that's why we that brings us to this whole concept of real returns which means what did you make over and above inflation so which means you put your money 100 5% was inflation and you got 5% returns on the bank so real returns are in a way zero so you would want to figure out what kind of assets or investing opportunities will give you real returns which means you got to make more than that 5% inflation that's when it's going to make sense otherwise you know your money is not really growing in um, in that sense it's growing in quantum wise but it's not trying it's not growing in in sync with inflation okay so so when it comes to figuring out your own targets for uh investing how much money should uh a particular asset class give me it's very important for you to factor in inflation without inflation any sort of a return is as good as nothing so that is one key thing that always keep in mind it, it applies to your salaries as well okay so if inflation is increasing and your salary is not increasing it essentially means you're getting paid lesser than the previous year because cost of living has gone up but your compensation has not so so that's um, you know about how inflation affects all aspects of our life okay and moving to another thing which some people some of us do especially when we were younger i used to do it to we we follow intuitively at least what is known as bucketing or um, you know goal based investing so what we do over here is we try to figure out okay i want to go on this vacation so i'll start keeping some money aside in this particular bank account and once it becomes 1 lakh i'm going to do this so likewise we put different different buckets and each bucket has got a purpose but then science tells us that actually that bucketing does not make any sense because you know at the end of the day uh the way to think about money is it doesn't matter whether you put in one bucket or the other bucket overall you have the same amount of money that's that amount of money has to grow that is one okay so it doesn't matter whether it's in buckets or not it only helps us psychologically maybe but other than that it has no other function okay the other bit is if you already have some kind of a credit or some kind of a loan going on it's more important that you clear that debt uh, rather than focusing on some sort of goal based investing so it should not happen that you are you know investing you're putting money aside in an fd on the other hand paying 10% interest on a loan that you have already so that makes no logical sense because the cost of that loan is way more might as well close it and then think about saving so that's another perspective when it comes to uh, saving when it comes to goal based investing that um, you may want to consider coming back to the idea of asset classes in the previous slide we spoke about uh, spoke a bit about different asset classes you know it could be debt which is you know in simple terms it could be an fd or a debt fund it could be equity it could be real estate gold and so on how do you kind of compare each of these asset classes and uh, because at the end of the day you have limited money and you have limited choices 
and you have to kind of allocate your money across different assets to get the best out of them you'll have to put some money in gold maybe some money in debt some money in equity and so on so on what basis do you typically make that decision so so one of it is return obviously which we spoke about the return has got to be more than um, you know what the inflation is at any given point of time okay the odds of you getting a higher return than the inflation should be high that's that's how i would put it okay and the second element is risk how much risk are you willing to take to get that return now if you look at debt or um, you know a simple fd there is um, almost zero risk there unless you know something happens to the bank but still you know hopefully it would be a large bank and rbi uh, would bail you out so you are not going to lose money in a bank but still there's zero risk at the same time the return just about match inflation okay so the next aspect is fine so you don't want that you want to make some money more than inflation so this is where you know you would have to look at other asset classes it could be equity and so on but how much risk are you willing to take 30% risk 20% risk so those are the questions which you may want to ask and this is where um, concepts like asset allocation and all those things come in which we'll talk about later 